Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us as we learn about the critically important issue of climate change. My name is Kelly Duke Bryant. I'm a faculty member in the Department of History and the coordinator of the International Studies and Area Studies programs here at Rowan. We are honored to host this event, Inequity at Boiling Point, what I've learned as a journalist covering the human toll of global warming a talk by Sumini Sengupta of the New York Times. This is the second annual Distinguished Lecture in Global Security organized by International Studies at Rowan. I would like to thank the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, the Hollywood Institute for Global Peace and Security, the Department of Journalism, the, Holly, uh, the Department of Geography, Planning and Sustainability for their co-sponsorship and support and colleagues James Heinsen and Tony Lynn for helping with the event today. This event was made possible by a generous grant from the United States Department of Education. It's called the Undergraduate International Studies and Foreign Language Grant. And Rowan received this grant to help us promote international studies at Rowan. I encourage you to learn more about our programs and events by visiting our website and a link to the website should appear in the chat shortly. A few words about the event structure before I introduce our main speaker. First, as you can see, this is a hybrid event. We have some participants in the room here. We also have at least two classes that are joining from their classrooms elsewhere on campus. And we have a substantial number of participants in the Zoom meeting itself. So lots of people are interested in this topic and we're really gratified to see so many people here. Ms. Sengupta will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes and her talk will be followed by a question and answer session which will be moderated by Professor Heinzen. Please ensure that your microphones are muted for the duration of her talk and for the Q&A unless we call on you to speak. And in fact, I've disabled um, unmuting. So in order to speak, I'll have to uh, I'll have to call on you. <clears throat> um, feel free to post questions in the chat at any time though, and keep an eye on that space for relevant links as the talk goes forward. So now I'm very pleased to introduce our main speaker. Samini so Sengupta has worked as a reporter for the New York Times for over 20 years. Her career has been truly global in scope taking her to nearly 50 countries where she has covered a wide range of issues. She has served as the Times Bureau Chief in West Africa and South Asia, and she's also reported from the Middle East. Her coverage of conflict in Congo and Liberia earned her the 2003 George Polk Award for Foreign Reporting. For the last several years, she has held the position of International Climate Correspondent writing articles about extreme weather events in both rich and poor <coughs> countries, inspirational young climate activists, the disproportionate impacts of climate change on vulnerable countries, COP26, domestic and international <coughs> climate politics, and many other topics. In February 2022, she took on a new role at the New York Times as anchor for the Climate Forward newsletter, which goes out by email to subscribers every Tuesday and Friday. Each newsletter begins with her column, which contains news analysis and commentary, and then highlights the week's essential climate news. And we encourage all of you to subscribe to the newsletter and the link should be appearing in the chat. In addition to her many articles for the Times, she's also the author of a 2016 <coughs> book entitled The End of Karma, Hope and Fury Among India's Young. And you can purchase that book through our local independent bookseller partner, Books Matter, or from the publisher website. Both of those should be available to you as well. In a recent interview, noting that successful articles rest on her ability to make people's stories and experiences relevant to readers, Ms. Sengupta talked about the importance of empathy in journalism. Empathy is evident in her coverage of many issues, including climate change. Indeed, in much of her recent work, she is most interested in the human stories of climate change, how it affects people's lives and livelihoods, how it presents people with new challenges, and the steps that people are taking to try to mitigate it. She has taken a particular interest 
in the impacts of climate change on marginalized people and on developing countries. And she explores how climate change reflects global inequity and shapes global security. These human stories are the focus of her talk for us today. Please join me in welcoming Somini Sengupta. Thank you. Um, thank you so very much for that kind introduction um, and for all that extra work getting the tech together. Um, and thank you all of you for showing up. Um, I know that these last two years have been a lot, especially for young people. So I really appreciate that you've shown up this afternoon for a discussion on climate change. And I hope I can be a little bit useful to you. Um, I hope I can help you understand what a hotter planet means for you, for me, for our communities, for our geopolitics, and what can be done about it. So if I could ask for some help with the slides, let's get some pictures up on the screen so you don't have to just look at my face. Um, first slide, please. Thank you. So when Kelly and I first began talking about these e this evening's discussion um, many months ago, we had no idea, at least I had no idea that Russia would invade Ukraine nor that it would have such a profound impact on um, the world's ability to address climate change. It is having some profound repercussions. You will hear many people argue that it's making it more urgent to pivot away from fossil fuels, oil and gas specifically, but also more complicated to pivot away from fossil fuels, which is the only way, according to scientists, to avert the wildfires, the floods, the heat waves that result from global warming. So I wanna to return to that, but first I wanna tell you a story. Next slide, please. I wanna tell you a story about Briseida Flores. Briseida was 19 when I met her in the summer of 2020. She was a student at a community college in Central California. And when her father lost his job in the early months of the pandemic, she joined her mother in the fields as a farm worker. The week I met her, it was the corn harvest and Central California was in the throes of a terrible heat wave. So Briseida began work at 4.30 in the morning when it was still a little cool, when it was still dark. In the distance, she could make out the faint outlines of a fire by 10.30 in the morning, it was so hot, her crew called it quits. Her clothes were sticking to her body. It was just impossible to go into those rows of corn. It was so hot. She came home and she went to bed. Soon after, there was so much smoke in the air that the local air pollution agency issued a health alert. I tell you this story about Briseida because it sums up for me a few of the lessons I've learned in covering the human toll of climate change. And those are the lessons that I wanna share with you today. Lesson one, we have already changed the climate of the planet we live on measurably. We must adapt to that fact. We must adapt to life on a hotter planet, but where we go from here is up to us. That's lesson one. Lesson two, Climate change exposes the sharp inequities already in our societies. Those who are poor, those who do backbreaking work, often outdoors at low wages, without health insurance, without sick pay, people like Briseida Flores, they face some of the most acute consequences of climate change. Globally, the poorest people in the world, those who are least responsible for the problem, face some of its most acute consequences. Lesson three, this is the decade when we can keep the world from getting hotter with, exp with exponentially worse climate impacts. And lesson four, finally, while it's tempting in the face of such an overwhelming problem to think that nothing can be done, that the world will become uninhabitable, you know, that's simply not true. The future is not foretold. We have choices, big choices. 
but choices that must be made immediately to pivot away from the combustion of fossil fuels. Next slide, please. So lesson one, here's what the scientific consensus tells us. It's too late to reverse the damage that we've already done to the Earth's climate. The average global temperature, that's the baseline, is about 1.1 degrees Celsius higher today than it was 150 years ago at the beginning of the industrial era. And that's because we burned a lot of gas and oil and coal in the last 150 years. By we, I mean mainly the United States and the industrialized nations of Europe historically, and since the mid 1980s, China. If you take a look at this graph, you will see that half of the emissions of greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere now have been produced since 1991. That's my adult lifetime. The impacts of those emissions, the impacts of the warming so far are being felt right now. So the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest last year when you know, Portland and Seattle and, and British Columbia and Canada hit those just mind boggling high temperatures. You remember the floods in Germany um, that killed uh, hundreds of people in, in Germany, Europe's most advanced economy. There was a once in 500 years uh, flood in Australia this year, and that was just a year after some of the worst wildfires that Australia had ever seen. So that's lesson number one, right? That there's already this much warming that is, if you will, baked in. Lesson number two, the impact of this climate change is not evenly or fairly spread, not at all. And the parallels to the coronavirus pandemic will be obvious to many of you. Like the pandemic, climate change exposes the very sharp inequities in our societies, different kinds of inequities in different societies. Next slide, please. If you're poor, you're much more vulnerable to extreme heat. You might be unable to afford an air conditioner. You might not even have electricity when you need it. You may have no choice but to work outdoors under a sun so blistering that first your knees feel weak and then delirium sets in. Or the heat might bring a drought so punishing that no matter how hard you work under the sun, your corn withers and your children turn to you and hunger. That's from a story I wrote in 2020 when we um, did a, a series uh, about the inequitable impacts of climate change. Decisions made in the past often affects the climate impacts that are felt today. So for example, in some places in the United States, redlining can place a city's black residents at far greater risk of living in a neighborhood with say fewer trees where hot days feel even hotter. The forced relocation of Native Americans in this country has left many Native communities exposed to greater climate risks. Next slide, please. In the city of Manila, if you are not wealthy, you're very likely to live in a neighborhood like this, at the mercy of sea level rise, at risk of getting flooded repeatedly, at risk of having a storm blow away your house of bamboo and tin, and probably with no insurance to rely on. So that brings us to lesson three. With this warming baked in, we have got to adapt. The baseline temperature is projected to be at least 1.5 degrees hotter by 2040. That's because of all the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere. So we've got to adapt fast to a world that's hotter, to a world with more extreme weather. That requires changing where we live, how we design cities, how we grow food, how we build things. Can those things be done? Well, yeah, actually there are many of many things are being done, just not at 
the scale and at the pace that's necessary. So for instance, local governments can put in place everywhere uh, early warning systems to tell people when bad weather, really bad weather is coming and to urge them to get out of the way. Local governments can figure out ways to conserve water or to restore floodplains so that when a really severe storm comes, the water has some place to go. Cities can build oyster reefs um, to protect their coastal communities. Uh, oyster reefs, believe it or not, um, basically slow down the waves um, so that they don't you know, barge against uh, the, the coast with as much severity. Cities can paint sidewalks white with reflective paint to cool down city blocks. So these are all the things that can be done. Some of them are being done to adapt. But there's also this other big set of choices that we face. And that's a choice to, to, to slow down the warming that's already underway. Because it's one thing for the baseline temperature to go up by 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a little over two degrees Fahrenheit. It's a whole other thing for temperatures to rise much beyond that. Because beyond that 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold, according to scientific consensus, the impacts are exponentially worse. They include things like massive crop failures becoming more likely, um, sea level rise becoming much, much worse and threatening the existence of you know, all our low-lying coastal cities. So we are, what do we know so far? So we are living on a planet where baseline, baseline temperatures are already higher and where the science is consistently telling us that it's likely to get higher. Okay. But to avert the worst consequences of climate change, the science tells us, requires cutting the emissions of greenhouse gases by nearly half by 2030. It, we're already in March 2022. So cutting greenhouse gas emissions by nearly half by 2030? Can that even be done? That feels so soon. Is that, is that even possible? Well, the world as a whole knows how to draw down the big categories of emissions pretty quickly. Not everything, but we know how to do a lot of things pretty quickly. Next slide, please. We know how to produce electricity and heat homes without burning oil, gas, and coal. These are wind turbines, of course. These are offshore wind turbines. Uh, one study last week concluded that the 27 countries of Europe could reduce its dependence on Russian gas by two thirds by 2025 if it really expands renewable energy and takes energy efficiency measures like insulating homes. So how to produce electricity without burning fossil fuels? We know how to do that. And by the way, the price of renewable energy has dropped really fast, much, much faster than anyone uh, anticipated. Same with transit. The world knows how to get people around by and large without burning gas. Next uh, slide, please. This um, is from a story I did uh, a few months ago. This is a picture from Bogota, Colombia. It's one of many cities that's decided to really um, revamp its public transportation systems. And Bogota has chosen to build a cable car line, an electric cable car line that brings folks who live in working class neighborhoods in the hills down into the valley. Um, and there's you know, lots of things can be done to electrify transit that go well beyond everyone buying an electric car. Same with how we grow food. That's another huge source of emissions. And how can we reduce emissions from food production? Well, we can stop mowing down forests to grow food. And we can do one more thing. We can stop wasting food. That is arguably the simplest, most common sense way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In the United States, one third of the food we grow is not eaten, 
it's wasted. That's wasted soil, water, fertilizers, energy to plow the fields, energy to transport all those tomatoes and avocados, energy to package them. And when all of that ends up in the trash, in landfills, what does it produce? It produces methane, a super potent greenhouse gas. So granted, there are some categories where it's hard to reduce emissions. We still don't have, for example, a really great uh, aviation fuel that is, um, you know, without greenhouse gas emissions. But in the big categories, in everyday transportation, in energy, in food production, we know how to bring down emissions. So why aren't we? What stands in the way? Well, shifting the global economy away from fossil fuels is disruptive. It's disruptive to the incumbents, including, of course, the fossil fuel industry. Enter Russia's war in Ukraine. Next slide, please. This is, a, this is an oil refinery in Russia. Russia, of course, is a petrostate. It makes a lot of money by selling oil and gas. Um, and it has effectively, over the last several years, it has effectively hooked the countries of Europe on its oil and gas. This is why Europe is now trying to wean itself off of Russian energy and having a very hard time doing it. And this is a really pivotal moment for Europe. It could be a moment for the 27 nations of the European Union to transition away from fossil fuels faster. So European lawmakers a couple of weeks ago said they wanna accelerate renewable energy, they wanna insulate homes, they wanna install electric heat pumps to move away from gas heating. That's all really, really important to slow down climate change. But watch very carefully in the next few weeks what Europe does with gas. Next slide, please. Europe uses a lot of gas for everyday electricity and heat. It gets more than a third of its gas supply from Russia, and it is scrambling to buy gas from other countries now. At first blush, you might think, well, that's not gonna be a problem for climate change, right? Just switch from Russian gas to say American gas. But this is where it gets tricky. Biden was in Europe last week, President Biden was in Europe last week. This is um, uh, an image of him with the European Union President Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, and President Biden was promising a surge of American gas, liquefied gas that comes on tankers, mostly from the Gulf of Mexico across the Atlantic Ocean. He was promising not just a little bit of extra gas to get Europeans through this year, but quite a bit more American gas until 2030. So a quick pause here, just on the words we use. Next slide, please. You'll hear the phrase natural gas. This is a natural gas processing plant in the US. You'll hear the words natural gas used very frequently. Gas is natural in the sense that it's a fossil fuel like coal, but it would be more precise to call it methane gas, because methane is its main element. It's the main ingredient. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the same gas processing plant, but this image is taken with an infrared camera and you can see the methane billowing from the plant here, uh, you can't see or smell methane uh, without, without a camera like this. So, okay, end of pause on the words natural gas versus methane gas. So where are we now? Well, uh, oil prices are soaring, as you know. U.S. oil production uh, is at record levels, oil and gas production. Record levels in an era of accelerating climate change. Oil and gas companies are earning very high profits. What do those companies want now? Well, at this moment when Russia is at war in 
Ukraine and Europe is trying to get off of Russian gas, uh, U.S. oil and gas companies are very keen to boost production. So American oil and gas companies want government permits to drill more, frack more, build more pipelines, export terminals. One of my colleagues who covers the oil industry just quoted an executive of a company that wants to build a new export terminal in, in Louisiana. And he said he's ready to build $100 billion worth of gas export infrastructure if investors can come up with the money. And by the way, it's not just American oil and gas companies that want to expand. Um, it's also Nigerian companies and Saudi companies and Qatari companies and Australian companies, basically, you know, the big producers of, 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 of gas. So this wartime enthusiasm for gas could very well lock in more fossil fuel infrastructure for a very long time. So keep an eye on what new infrastructure gets built in Europe, in the United States, in other gas producing countries, because that could really have an impact for many, many years to come. Next slide, please. And I wrote about this for a recent column in our, in our newsletter. Um, essentially, whatever is built in this wartime gas surge will have long lasting consequences on the global climate. And mind you, the International Energy Agency, that's the global organization that advises governments on their energy policy. It's not exactly an activist group. The International Energy Agency has said quite unequivocally, there can be no new investments in oil, gas, or coal starting this year if the world as a whole is to stay within that sort of reasonable level of warming within that 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. Last week, I was um, listening to the head of that organization, the head of the International Energy Agency, Fatih Birol, speak to a room full of energy ministers and oil industry executives. And uh, he said very plainly that he was worried quote, that our climate goals may be another victim of Russia's aggression, end quote. Next slide, please. So that's where we are. This is the part where you might be throwing up your hands and saying, okay, this problem of climate change you're talking about is so big, is so unwieldy, is so far away from my life right now that, you know, we're doomed. That's what you might be thinking. Well, there's actually very little evidence to support the hypothesis that we are doomed. The future is not foretold. The future depends on a series of human decisions that are being made right now. Political decisions, financial decisions, social decisions being made right now. That brings us to the last lesson that I wanna share with you. And that is, there's a lot being done um, right now to address this big, huge global problem of climate change. Ordinary people all over the world are using their skills, their passions, their votes in their communities, in their workplaces, in their universities to address climate change. I'll give you a few examples. Lawyers are taking fossil fuel companies to court. Students are pushing their universities to divest from fossil fuel companies. Shareholder groups are pushing publicly held companies to shift to cleaner energy faster. Architects are trying to build buildings for a hotter planet. Engineers are retrofitting old buildings so they don't use gas. Workers are insulating attics. Community organizers are working with supermarkets to rescue food that's still edible, but that's getting thrown away. Next slide, please. Artists are making art. I saw this installation piece, which is made with 3000 LED light bulbs in, in Scotland, it was on the banks of the Clyde River in Glasgow, just in front of the convention center where the last international climate talks were being held in November. 
Storytellers, including journalists like me, are trying to help our readers understand the world better, to write about the world as it is and the world as it could be. Next slide, please. The future is not foretold. We have choices. And that is what I write about. I write about that twice a week in the Climate Forward newsletter to write about the world as it is and the world as it could be. And I really encourage you to sign up. Uh, if you are not a subscriber, please do uh, consult with your university to figure out how you can get a student subscription. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to a discussion. That was great. Thank you so much, uh, Samini. Um, I would just like to remind everyone that you can post a question in the chat and we will, we will gladly read your questions. Um, I want to uh, quickly put in a, a word for the international studies major, which you can follow uh, you can click on this link and follow it. It's a very, um, I think that uh, Samini's talk may have inspired some of you to, to study more um, the effect of climate change globally. Um, in the United States, we mostly hear about the effects here, but um, it's really important to realize that the United States is, is almost unique in many ways in, in uh, the way that climate change is um, handled here. Um, I don't see any questions yet. If anybody would like to um, identify themselves with a hand raised too, we can call on you that way. I'll, I'll go ahead and ask a question. I remember last summer, Samini, you reported on uh, what you were talking about earlier, which was the fact that normally what we've seen is these extreme climate events hitting, hitting outside of Europe and outside of North America. And last summer, um, we had this whole series of catastrophic events, which you described. I wonder if there's in some weird way, a kind of upside to that. Um, maybe upside's the wrong word, but in the sense that it's going to, it, that it drew attention to climate change in those parts of the world that are really among the biggest polluters and those who are most responsible for, for um, you know, addressing these problems, do, do you see any kind of, did you, do you think that there's any kind of effect on yeah. American political figures? I mean, I think it's a really, it's an excellent question. I wrote a story. Um, uh, it was a page one story in the New York times that essentially said climate change has come to the rich world. It's, it became impossible uh, to turn your gaze from extreme weather events in the countries of Europe, uh, in the United States, in Australia. That is not to say that we hadn't been hit by uh, extreme heat waves, uh, extreme flooding, you know, a very long um, and unpredictable drought in the American Southwest. I mean, we had seen those things before. Uh, but last year, there was really just a succession uh, of, of extreme weather events exacerbated by climate change. And absolutely, we did hear from lawmakers in Europe, in the United States, about um, taking that on. First, adapting to it, you know, acknowledging that it is very much um, here, so adapting to it, but also to uh, rapidly cut down greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. And it, incidentally, when I was reporting that story, I heard from many people in the countries of the global south who said, this is what we've been telling you for years. And you, you know, not only haven't um, uh, drawn down your own, your own emissions fast enough, you haven't even shored up enough money to help us, the countries of the developing world who did not um, cause this problem of climate change by and large, you didn't pony up the money that you promised 
to help us pivot to renewable energy sources to help us adapt. So there was um, there was a uh, there was quite um, it was quite a, a stark moment I thought last year. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of questions from students who are asking about what they can do. Um, one student says, um, "What are things that we can do in our day to day lives?" as students don't have, who don't have a whole lot of time to help combat climate change? Um, first, understand the, the science. Um, get your head around, you know, what it means for, for your community, for your, um, for your families, for your university. It's really, and, and, and start talking about it. One thing that um, the climate scientist, Catherine Hayhoe, um, uh, talks about, and, and I, I find this really, really revealing, she says that, um, you know, Americans do not by and large talk about this issue with their friends and family, in part because, you know, you think it's such a polarizing, such a divisive issue. In fact, uh, in public opinion surveys done in the United States, a very small share of, uh, of the public, roughly 8%, uh, are what you might call dismissives, right? They dismiss the climate science altogether. There are a whole lot of other people, a clear majority of Americans who are concerned about what climate change is doing um, in their communities and who want to see um, government action. It, look, in, in answer to the question, you know, what can individuals do, certainly in countries like the United States, which are uh, high emitters per capita, right? We, are, we have very high per capita emissions. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we can do um, kind of every day, I think, is, is, is on the issue of food waste, because it really is a huge source of emissions, in addition to cutting down on your personal food waste in the in your apartment or whatever, you know, there's probably a lot you can do if you speak to your fellow students um, about how much food is being procured in in dining halls, in cafeterias. Um, you can take a look at what your university's impact on emissions might be. You can join local groups in whatever way you feel taps into your skills and your passions, whether you're an engineering student or a public health student or an artist. Um, this is an issue that impacts all of you, all of us. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question about the, the global north versus the global south um, from Professor Gadot. And he says that the global north meaning United States, Europe, and so on, is responsible for most of the historic carbon dioxide emissions, but the global South is suffering the worst effects in many cases. Is anything being done to share the mitigation and carbon emissions um, between the global North and the, and the global South to, to try to bridge this gap? Um. So let's rewind. It's an excellent point and, and one that our series on, on um, inequity, the inequity of climate change really tried to, um, to drill down on. Um, the Paris Agreement, which is the big global climate accord, every country is a signatory to the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement essentially says, every country should set their own targets to either reduce emissions, as is the case for the countries of the global north, or slow down the increase of their emissions, as is um, the case for many emerging economies. The Paris Agreement doesn't tell countries, this is what you must do. It leaves it to countries to set their own targets, to come back and report to the rest of the world, how do they do? Uh, and the idea is that there's a system of sort of diplomatic peer pressure that each country sort of says, look, this is what we promised, this is what we've been able to do. And it, um, 
and it leans on other countries to do the same. Here's the issue. Here's the problem, though. One, um, there, there is no enforcement, right? By definition, there is no enforcement for, for this sort of thing. It is up to each country to, um, to set its own target and to implement them. The United States, under President Biden, has set some extremely ambitious targets, but it's unclear how we're going to meet those targets. Uh, China has set some fairly unambitious targets um, and is on track to meet them. Uh, what China and the United States are able to do in the coming years is going to be key for everybody else. The United States is history's largest emitter, China is the largest source of emissions right now, today. Uh, and so whether they can cooperate to reduce emissions or engage in some sort of virtuous competition to reduce emissions, what these two countries do is really, really crucial. And of course, the United States and China are currently you know, locked in um, pretty difficult relations. So, so that's not helped. And finally, one of the um, elements of the Paris Global Accord is, yeah, you industrialized countries that have been producing emissions for all these years, you got to help us meet our own challenge. That's what you're hearing from emerging economies, less, less developed nations, um, and that means money. There's a promise of um, $100 billion a year uh, that should have kicked in by 2020. Um, the industrialized nations of the world are not, you know, haven't ponied up that money yet. It's two years after 2020. We'll see when that money comes. But without that money, there's also really a lack of trust on the part of many um, uh, countries in, in the global south. So, you know, watch what, uh, what happens this year um, uh, and if that money comes together, comes forward. Great. Um, we have a lot of questions in the chat. I just want to remind people if, if you'd rather just ask the question yourself, uh, just raise your hand in the raise hand function and we'll call on you. You can ask, um, submit me the question face to face. Uh, until that time, let me just read another question. There's a question about um, suburbanization in the United States. And it says that, I know that in the United States, there's a lot of suburban infrastructure. Of course, not only in the United States, but how, how would you suggest that we convert to a more sustainable model? It's a really good question. Um, far be it from me as a journalist to um, make those kinds of suggestions. But... Um, what I'll tell you is that, you know, decisions that are being made right now by your lawmakers, by your legislators are going to impact that. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, is the infrastructure bill and all the taxpayer dollars that go into the infrastructure bill, is that going to build more mass transit, more public transportation, or is that going to um, build more roads and, and bridges. The budget that came out yesterday, President Biden's proposed budget for fiscal year 2023, uh, includes a lot of money for the Department of Transportation. The largest chunk of that money is for roads and bridges. And, you know, there's a political fight where uh, a lot of governors, Republican governors by and large, want to build new roads and, and highways with that money. So, you know, this is sort of playing out as we, as we speak, what kind of infrastructure is going to be built? Uh, that's just on, on, um, on transportation, but what kind of housing is gonna be built too? A lot of people can't afford to live in cities where public transit is more available. Um, and so, you know, Part of the answer lies also in, in whether there's going to be more housing built um, 
and more affordable housing built so that, uh, you know, regular people can can get on buses and, and trains. Yep. Thank you. Which is um, another way of, sorry to, to interrupt, yeah. which is another way of answering the earlier question of what can I do? Like, if you're interested in city planning, that's one way you can think about the problem and address the problem, right? If you're an engineer, there are many ways for you to plug in. Um, you know, if you're interested in affordable housing development, if you're interested in traffic planning, uh, climate change and how to live with climate change and how to slow down climate change um, requires all of those specialists. Right, thank you. Um, we have another question that is, um, that is coming up and that is about sort of, I think it's, I would say it's about people who don't really believe in climate change, that climate change is man-made and um, it's particularly in political life and whether you have any, any sort of suggestions or optimism about the possibility of changing people's minds who are in powerful positions, but who are resistant to the very notion of man-made climate change. Um, it's called voting. You know, as I said, the, a majority, a clear majority of Americans, to say nothing of other countries, but a clear majority of Americans recognize um, what the science says. Um, it is scientific consensus. There is no scientific debate on whether the combustion of fossil fuel warms up the atmosphere or not. This is settled science. Uh, and there are um, some, especially in the fossil fuel industry, who have been very successful in, in weaponizing doubt in that scientific consensus that has been widely um, studied, that has been widely covered. Um, so, it, you know, climate change is not, is not a matter of belief. It's not you know, the, the, truth, the tooth fairy, um, it's a matter of established scientific, rigorous scientific um, inquiry. And the consensus is, is quite clear on that. Um, and increasingly you will, you will find that um, while in the United States, it is politically a polarizing issue what I've also seen in um, public opinion surveys is that it is less of a polarizing issue among Democrats and Republicans who are younger. It's much more polarizing um, among, you know, in the baby boomer generation, uh, for instance, than it is among millennials. Yeah. Um that's, which is a good sign. Um, let's see, we have a question that asks, um, what do you believe is the best way to sort of wean Americans off of automobiles or not, not to wean them off automobiles, but to, to encourage them to use electric cars? Or, well, I mean, that's such a complicated question. Um, and it's a really good one, right? Um, if I live in New York City, I don't really need a car. If I did need a car, could I afford right now an electric car? I'm not sure that I could, to be honest with you. Um, I would could, you know, if I absolutely needed one, um, I would have to look for a secondhand one, or maybe wait another couple of years so that the prices come down. And so this is a question not just about individuals choosing, right? This is a question about are car makers um, making enough cars so that, um, you know, the, the price is coming, coming down. Um, are there places where 
you don't have to have a car. And can more people afford to live there, as I was saying before? Uh, is there enough charging infrastructure? Um, that's, that's, a, that's a huge uh, question mark. In many parts of the country, there still isn't. Um, and is there policy? Are there policy instruments to encourage more people to buy electric? For instance, with tax incentives. Um, in Norway, uh, I was surprised to learn, and Norway is not a poor country. It's a very wealthy country. Its wealth comes from its oil. Be that as it may, electric car sales in Norway are really, really high. And it's really high in part because it's actually cheaper to buy a new electric car than an internal combustion engine car in Norway because of, because of government policy. So, so, the, so the question is a really good one. It depends on a lot of things. But it's, to me, it's less an individual choice question um, uh, than it is a question of, of policy, of economic policy, public policy, infrastructure policy. I think I read recently that something like 3% of automobiles in the United States sold now are uh, fully electric cars. And in Norway, awesome. something like it's something like 70% or something in Norway. It's very high. I'm not sure of the exact percentages. It's very high. And I was just very surprised, um, you know, to hear. And there were requirements for, for some sectors to go electric. Taxi drivers in a city that I, that I went to um, in Norway last year were telling me that they need to convert their, their taxi fleets to all electric. And I asked them if they were concerned about that, if that was going to be financially onerous. Um, and, you know, most of them said no, because it's cheaper to buy an electric car. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question about China, um, which is uh, a big fossil fuel user, as you've stated. And the question is about if, if you have any speculation about how China's fossil fuel emissions will be impacted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, if at all. That's an excellent question that I want to, to watch and learn more about. Um, China is uh, the world's, from China comes the largest share of emissions right now, in large part because of how much coal China burns. Mm -hmm. um, China is by far the world's largest coal producer, and it's still building coal-fired power plants. Um, that is a huge problem for emissions. As for its relationship with Russia, we know that China buys Russia, Russian coal. China burns so much coal, it has to get it from, from a whole bunch of places. And China is one of the um, major buyers of Russian coal. Um, so certainly that, um, that helps Russia find uh, a market. China is also, of course, a buyer of Russian, um, uh, Russian oil and gas. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so this is an area to watch. I do think that it's, um, it's, it's really important to, um, to, to see how this relationship um, plays out in, in fossil fuel uh, exports, particularly. Yeah, another really important question for the global south and the less developed part of the world in general is the question of nuclear energy, um, which, you know, in some ways is a, is a solution to a lot of these problems. It's a trade-off. But, um, in, you know, in your, in your experience, are you, um, I guess I just want to ask you about how, 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 um, non-Western countries in particular are thinking about nuclear power? Is it still considered to be a really important option? Are there, are there concerns about safety? Do the concerns about safety you know, outweigh the emissions issues? Or how does that balance kind of? Um, yeah. You know? 
I think in both um, Global North countries and Global South countries, the mm -hmm. question of nuclear is uh, a live one. There are those that consider it a, um, a, a real solution in the climate era. And there are those who, um, who point out its, its, its risks. And so in France, nuclear energy is a, a huge chunk of their energy supply across the border. In Germany, of course, um, it's not. There are um, public concerns. There are real public concerns about, about nuclear. So I think this is a question for you know, the citizens of every country, whether it's, um, it's a developing country or a developed country, to, to, to weigh the, the, um, the risks and the advantages of, of nuclear power. It is, of course, also extremely expensive. So that is another question to, to weigh. Um, it is extremely expensive in relation to wind and solar in mm -hmm. particular, because the price of renewables is, uh, especially the price of solar, is dropping very, very fast. Hmm. Um, I have a question. We have a question from um, someone about, um, about, the, about the issue of information overload. So, you know, I think we're all feeling it. And a question like this, or an issue like this that's politically controversial, even if it's settled science, as you point out, is um, going to generate all kinds of conflicting mm -hmm. points of view or conflicting bits of information. So somebody asked that I find myself um, feeling bombarded with upsetting climate-related news. And so this is really about you know, bad news. So how might you, how might you recommend people avoid being burned out or pushed away um, from learning about the topic of climate change due to how depressing it can be? Mm -hmm. Look, I, I um, contend with that uh, uh, every day. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that while I uh, can see that climate can be a politically polarizing issue in the United States. I just want to underscore that it's actually not as polarizing as, as sometimes we believe um, or we are led to believe. Um, the, a, a large majority of Americans really do think that this is an important issue. It should be tackled. Um, a large majority of Americans think that renewable energy should be, um, should be expanded. Um, and a clear majority of Americans get this, think that schools ought to teach more about climate science. So um, that's sort of on the polarization question, but on the general issue, um, I do think it really helps to educate yourself on what the science says, what the risks are, but also educate yourself on what can be done, uh, both to adapt, and to, to mitigate. And by mitigate, we mean to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases, because there's a lot that really can be done, that is being done. And the more you learn about that, and the more you can plug into that in your own communities, um, perhaps that's a better way to, um, you know, to help you understand your place. In, in all of this and, and what you want to do about it. Um, by all means, if you got to take a little break from, um, you know, from, from all, the, all the, you know, crummy news, you know, take a little break. But, um, but, but, you know, these are the risks that, present us. These are the risks that we are facing. And there's a lot that can be done about it. Uh, so, so please try to, um, you know, please try to seek out as much information about both of those things. Um, and, and, and we try to strike that balance. I don't know that we succeed all the time. I would love to hear from our readers whether we need more of something and less of something else. I would love to hear that from, from all of you going forward. But I do, I do face that, that question of balance, especially in the newsletter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Is there anyone in the audience or in Kelly in your classroom who would like to ask a question? Yeah, I think we have, there's at least one person in here who'd like to ask. Yeah. So, um, Sarah, just talk really loud because I'm not sure how strong. Okay. Yeah. Is. So um, you said that you've been to 50 different countries and you're reporting and I'm just kind of switching gears here. Um, you know, we know that um, war is often and conflict is often caused by lack of resources or, um, you know, a fight over resources, water, food, that sort of nature. Have you in your reporting seen any local conflict and do you suspect that global conflict is imminent based off of global climate change? Um, I've reported on lots of localized um, competition over resources such as water, right? Um, in, in the Middle East, in parts of India, for sure. Um, I think it's tricky to link climate change directly to global conflict. Like, there are some risks there. So, you know, if, for example, there's a, there's a water scarcity and you have, um, you know, different groups competing for that water um, that can sometimes lead to, for example, in, in Syria, before the war began, there was a long running drought. Um, there, were, um, there were protests on the street about higher food prices. Um, the government uh, responded to those protests in a very hard, um, uh, hard-handed way, to to to, um, to put it mildly. Um, but it would be incorrect to say climate change caused this conflict. Climate change can exacerbate, be a threat multiplier to several things that can then lead to conflict. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, Mina, I think um, I'll just, I'll ask one more question. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you can just tell our audience, um, any of whom are students, how you originally got interested in climate change and sort of what was, your, what was your path to your current, you know, your current job as a reporter talking about climate change? Um, just give us some, give some of your own sort of personal journey to this moment. Yeah, sure. No, that's a great question. Um, so I've been a reporter for a really, really long time. Um, uh, I, I've covered a, a whole bunch of things from local politics to, you know, education issues, um, immigration issues. And I went overseas first to uh, West and Central Africa, where um, I wrote a lot about uh, conflict, um, but also saw, you know, a competition over natural resources um, in many of those, those countries. Then I went to South Asia as a South Asia Bureau chief based in New Delhi, um, and I encountered some of those other, you know, the, what, what communities were um, we're seeing on the front lines of climate change. So, for for instance, I remember going to to Bangladesh years and years ago and hearing from people that you know more storms were coming and washing away their entire um, fields, their farms, destroying their houses again and again. I remember talking to farmers in India and Nepal who said the rains were becoming so erratic, so unpredictable. Um, so I was seeing some of the frontline impacts um, in, in, my, in my reporting. Um, and then a few years ago, the New York Times was expanding um, our climate coverage, our climate desk, and, um, uh, and I put up my hand because I thought this was really the issue that I wanted to learn about. I did not really specialize in science coverage. Um, I didn't really report on environmental issues a lot, you know, historically, um, but I was interested, you know, I was seeing it sort of pop up as a factor um, in, in many places. So I raised my hand and um, 
then uh, became the international climate correspondent and, and really defined that job as telling the stories of human beings, feeling the toll of climate change rather than um, um, telling the story of you know, degrees Celsius or parts per million of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, yeah, so that's been, uh, and, I, and I am blessed, really. I am so lucky that I can um, knock on doors and have strangers invite me into their homes and tell me their stories. That is the biggest, really the, the greatest gift. Um, so I try to, I try to take care of that. You know, I try to really respect, um, their stories and their experiences and convey that, um, humanely and, and empathetically. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I, um, actually wanted to ask you one more question, which is just to talk a little bit about your book, which I've just posted a link to, um, in the chat, um, we encourage people to purchase this really fascinating book. Um, we I've posted a link to a local, um, a local independent bookstore called Words Matter, and um, um, if you would like to uh, buy it there. But if you could just tell us a little bit about the book that you wrote. Yeah, okay. thanks, Great. and and thank you so much for um, supporting your local independent bookstore. I I um, really appreciate that. Um, so I was in India as a bureau chief, and um, I was really struck by the most obvious thing that was all around me, which is that India was home to the largest number of young people um, of any country in the world at any time in human history. I mean, you know, it was it, it is um, uh, uh, going through this enormous, you know, youth bulge. And I wanted to write about that. I wanted to, to, um, to, to talk to young people about, um, you know, what, uh, how they were pushing their country in, in, in many ways. And so essentially the book is a story of seven young people. And I followed them over the years um, and the many challenges that they pose to India's democracy, to um, for economic opportunities, for social changes. Um, yeah. And so that book was published in, in uh, 2016. One of my great regrets is that the book really doesn't look at um, climate change in India. Um, but that's for, for maybe another project further down the road. It's, it's really well reviewed and um, sounds like a fantastic book. I just wanna make one quick announcement before um, I let you go. And that is that next week, actually April 5th at 11 o'clock, um, we're gonna have a talk on the issue of climate change in New Jersey by Dr. Andrea Garner, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Sciences here and her title the title of her talk is understanding climate change in new jersey challenges ahead and hope for the future and i think that you know piggybacking on uh samini's talk it'll be really fascinating a way to kind of get a, a very local take on climate change and like samini she she emphasizes also that you know um the future is not foretold as samini kept saying that there are things that we can do individually as a community and um so I really encourage you to come and talk. That's also on Zoom. I put the link in the chat. So um, uh, let me just turn things back over to Kelly. Um, yes, yeah, so I would just like to thank everyone for being here. Thanks to faculty members for bringing their students, to students who chose to come uh, on your own and spend an hour or so with us. Um, to all my colleagues in the audience and everyone who helped support this, and especially to our guest, Samini Sengupta, for her time. She's been very generous with us, um, and I think we've all learned a lot from this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your great questions.